On April 2nd, 2004, Crunchyroll will sunset the Funimation app, which will serve as the culmination of a merger several years in the making. I'm sure a lot of folks have thoughts about this, particularly how Crunchyroll will now become the most expensive anime app for seemingly little additional content. If anything, the app will become worse, with the company floating around the idea of using AI to quicken the pace on its already messy subtitles, which in order to keep in pace with the demands of the voracious anime fandom, sometimes is done shoddily. However, one component of this merger people aren't talking about, because I suppose you'd expect this to be something to have a handle on at this point, if they're doing a the whole merger and all that, are all the titles that will be lost once the merger is complete. And there are several titles that are exclusively available on the Funimation app that have not been brought over to the Country Roll app yet. All of these licenses remain in the hands of Sony, the parent company of both Funimation and Crunchyroll. Yet for one reason or another, they have not yet been brought over. If you think these are small titles being lost in the cracks, think again. Escaflone, The Slayers, Tenchi Muyo, Serial Experiments Lane. These are some big names that might in part be lost. And while it's likely that a 2B or a Retro Crush will cr come along, if these titles aren't just brought into Crunchyroll, it reminds anime fans of the ephemeral nature of Western availability. These are titles that, even back in the days of physical media, would go out of print. Even select dubs like the ADV Neon Genesis Evangelion dub are difficult to find now outside of collector re-releases. Ah, uh, you're thinking in Japanese, aren't you? If you must think, do it in German! Uh, well, I'll try. Uh, strudel, bratwurst... Don't go off! Never mind! This is where piracy comes in. Piracy used to be a very major instrumental element of the anime fan experience. It's a joke among millennial fans that we had to watch Lucky Star and 240p on YouTube split into three parts, each part eight minutes long, but that's a joke only because that's how we did it. That's how we had to watch Lucky Star and so many other anime at that time that were just coming out. Fan sub torrents. Names retranslated in ways that deviated from the American and Japanese release. Translator notes that over-explained the minutiae of the language that we're watching. These were commonplace. They were expected elements of the anime fan community. And it's stuff that's kind of died away for a little bit, but I think it shouldn't have. That was a mistake we made, letting those things die to wither on the vine. And before we had all those fan translations that were available online, you'd have to go to the flea markets or to the New York City back alleys. Like it's like some kind of illicit deal. You'd have to go into the back corner with the little VHSs behind the counters. Oh, I want the good stuff. You know, and bring out uh, a box set of, uh, I don't know, um, Legend of the Overfiend or something, who knows. So why did we stop pirating anime? And why is it becoming clear that we made a mistake to stop? Or maybe for most of us, maybe we should stop. I mean, some of you are probably still pirates who I'm talking about. Now, if you like what I do here, take the time to like and subscribe this video. It really helps tell YouTube, hey, show more me to you, uh, your friends. And if you can't stand me, please dislike the video and leave an angry comment. I I'm looking for engagement in any way, Cakes, man. Uh, what are you going to do? Play that machine. Listen, you got to play the, the, the game how, they, how it's supposed to be played. You know what I'm saying? So, anyway. This flag stands for freedom. And I live for what it stands for. Piracy has had a huge impact on the early anime fandom, especially when it comes to watching the forbidden content you'd only read about in magazines or see online. Meet Misty, a sweet... <laughs> Turn around, Togepi! Lovable... Go, Duck, you're the best! Time bomb just waiting to explode! Pokemon's dub was immensely popular, sure, but there were three episodes you'd never hope to see uncensored. And sure, most people know the dub took, um, shall we say, uh, liberties with the original language. These donuts are great! Jelly-filled are my favorite! Nothing beats a jelly-filled donut! But most fans knew of three banned episodes that would never air on Western television. <laughs> One was the infamous swimsuit episode, which was eventually brought over after Pokemon fan magazine circulated screen grabs of the episode, clearly ripped from a second leg uh, bootleg tape, 
um, featuring James with some, shall we say, inflatables. The second episode was a Dratini episode, which happened to feature Ash capturing the numerous Taurus he'd later use in the series. Now, this was banned due to, shall we say, a liberal use of firearms. And then there's the Porygon episode. I don't think I need to explain why the most infamous episode of Pokemon was banned. Regardless of why, these episodes of Pokemon remained unreleased stateside for a while. I mean, the the beach episode was eventually released heavily edited with most of James's um taken out, but the rest have not been released stateside yet. The only way to watch at the time was if fans circulated the tapes. A process made far easier as the internet made video downloading far, far easier. I mean, a few of you guys know this, but it was not fun downloading videos on dial-up internet. I will say that right now. You could It would take a day to get one 20-minute episode of a show at, at low quality. So, no, forget it. We're not going back to that. But that was the infancy of piracy. You are the original way to transfer fan subs back then actually was to hard sub record on video cassettes. Back in the day, you'd have two VHS players, one would be plugged in with a videotape, the other would be plugged in. You'd have to record, and then you have a machine that would like layer the subtitles on top. It was a whole nightmare with analog technology, which we don't do anymore. But. That's how we had to deal. It was time consuming, it was slow, it would take maybe a year to get a whole series on videotape, but we got those tapes. Sailor Moon, weekday mornings on Kids TV. When Sailor Moon first aired on Western televisions, there was no way to watch it uncensored. This was back in the day when websites had to explain to kids what Deke and Cloverway cut out of the anime as it made the trip from Japan to our airwaves. Oh, look! Here come Amara and Michelle! Oh, great! Why do you think they've entered the contest? They're girls and cousins, too! But if you wanted to watch these original shows, well, you'd have to watch it subbed. And the only way to get subs was through unofficial channels, either through downloading it slowly over dial-up internet or bootleg tapes. The DVD series that took the dueling world by storm now continues with another volume of Yu-Gi-Oh! Unedited, unchanged, and uncut. Eventually, studios got wise to the fact that their audience, as they grew up, wanted to watch uncensored anime content. Now, manga thrived in the uncensored entries. Viz Media had a ton of these coming out there. First, they started with the, the flipped manga, and then they went, realized, oh, people want to read manga in its original form, and started distributing Shonen Jump and all that. But... Anime struggled a little bit in this regard. Sailor Moon's uncensored sub release proved popular enough, but the uncensored 4Kids releases of Yu-Gi-Oh!, Shaman King, and the non-4Kids release of Cardcaptor Sakura had trouble being distributed. Yu-Gi-Oh! in particular had the fabled Season Zero, which drew in an almost fabled fascination due to just how different in tone and style it was from the rest of the series in part because it was made by a different animation studio, but I digress. Now, the manga sphere had all of this uncensored content available, but not animation. This led to a very devoted, very small group of fans who banded together to redistribute these anime uncensored across the web, sometimes having to translate the anime themselves through a painstaking process. It's also very important to note that Funimation and ADV did not encounter the same problems that four kids and their, and their ilk did, because they made uncensored versions of the anime they licensed fairly available. You know, obviously uh, uh, Funimation at the time came famous for its Dragon Ball Z uh, box sets, which they'd release in censored and uncensored tapes, before eventually just moving into a fully uncensored model of distribution. Keep in mind back then, this is when anime was primarily targeted towards younger younger kids. ADV though, they had a little bit of an edge because their market uh, from the beginning kind of leaned more towards the adult side of the fandom. And very importantly, ADV helped distribute titles like Sailor Moon uncensored, accommodating a clear demand in the fandom. But for many, 
This became the birthplace of the fan market, distributing anime unblemished by censorship. But as the anime market expanded, there became other reasons to pirate. Availability. And it's this reason that we're, that we're bumping up against right now. <gasps> it's happening again! Nowadays, anime is all over the place. So it might sound weird to say that, you know, to young kids, that years ago, anime was a hot commodity. We couldn't get enough of it, and there wasn't a whole lot available on American airwaves. You had Toonami, you had what was on WB and uh, Fox Kids, and that was about it. You didn't have many options beyond that. I remember going to my local library when I was younger and browsing the DVD sections for anime I hadn't seen yet. Right next to the manga section, which had manga in the YA section that were... I'm a little surprised they were put there, but, you know, I digress. I'm not complaining. But, you know, one of the things was a lot of those DVDs were titles I'd never heard of before. I'm pretty sure a lot of libraries have phased out their DVD phase. This might not even be, like, relevant to most of my audience, but I digress. Anyway, one of the titles that I noticed at first was a title called Chobits, which was distributed by a company called Genion USA. And there were a bunch of other DVDs with that same logo next to it. So I always associated Genion with my earliest anime experiences of shows that were not broadcasted on either Toonami or Adult Swim. So who was Genion? Genion USA was the Western branch of Genion Entertainment, but it didn't start out as a Japanese uh, subsidiary. Rather, it started as a New Jersey-based company. So, you know, New Jersey, go. Go back to Jersey, you moron! <laughs> Pioneer LDC was a New Jersey-based company, and later California company, that focused on video and Laserdisc sales. But starting in 93, it began to distribute anime and anime-associated media. One of the first titles it distributed was Tenchi Muyo. But the most important discovery you'll make is that six crazy women living under the same roof all have the hots Tenchi. What? for him. Now, its success led Pioneer to focus increasingly on distributing anime content in anime VHS tapes, and later, anime DVDs. Among the companies making deals with Pioneer were Viz Media and Bandai Entertainment. This is one of the reasons why, if you let those old Pokemon VHS tapes run a little too long, you start seeing ads for stuff like Rama One Half, Kimba the White Lion, or The Dog of Flanders. Does anyone else remember The Dog of Flanders? That was a really depressing movie. The Dog of Flanders. Available on video from Pioneer Entertainment. And a depressing book, because of course I had to read the book, you know, because what, 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 what do you take me for? It was years later in 2003 that this successful distribution company was acquired by the Japanese company Dentsu and was thus renamed Genion. Pioneer became Genion. Ironically, a company that had been aware of for years became the very anime distributor that was giving me anime that I had seen for the first time. Because I knew about Pioneer, I watched all the all the Pokemon VHS tapes. How do you think I know about the Dog of Flanders? Because those tapes... Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. Now, if the idea of a Japanese company acquiring an American distributor sounds familiar, it should. Because history repeats itself, and Sony did that very thing with Funimation and Crunchyroll. But we'll get to that in a bit. And the problems that this acquisition process might cause. Later on, Genion entered into a deal with Toei to distribute many of their titles, stuff like Air Master and Slam Dunk were the most noteworthy, but the deal barely lasted two years, from November 11th, 2004 to September 18th, 2006. And after that, the titles went out of print. Think about that. Slam Dunk, an anime more popular than Dragon Ball in Japan, out of print in the U.S., and I think that contributed to why Slam Dunk never had the foothold that, say, DBZ or Yu Yu Hakusho had over here in the West. A lack of availability. Now, a few key things happened uh, to impact Genion. So Viz Media decided to branch off on its own and distribute its own titles, which it's doing to this very day. Um, but Genion became the sole distributor of Bankai Namco titles, which this included but was not limited to titles like Cowboy Bebop, Gundam, Trigun, among others. But the strangest thing comes in when ADV and Genion decided to strike a deal. At the time, ADV was second only to Funimation in terms of raw anime distribution. And the two companies, Genion and ADV, decided to form an alliance to compete with Funimation, which would outlive both of them ultimately. 
And they had a great plan in place. You see, ADV would distribute all of Genion's titles that had licensed over the years. They'd handle the marketing, uh, the sales, the everything. Distri distribution. And in return, Genion would lay off most of their staff, focusing exclusively on managing their own portfolio of work uh, as a licensor, and ADV would do all distribution and marketing and sales. And Genion would be like basically a, a remnant of the core executives in the top. And I mean, listen, I don't have a business. I'm not a business major. I know what I know. I know what I know. But um, that sounds like a shitty deal, personally. <laughs> For Jenny on it, there's a lot of red flags at place here. So obviously the red flags. Like, you're, you're laying off most of your company, becoming entirely dependent on ADV, assuming that they're going to hold through with their end of the bargain. And they laid off everyone before the deal was signed. They laid off everyone so that when the deal fell through, they were left with nothing. Not a great plan. The strategic alliance between ADV and Genion fell apart in late 2007, which was closely followed by Genion folding. They should have seen it coming, quite frankly. Releases were canceled. Titles lost distribution. It was a mess. And a lot of big titles, from Cowboy Bebop to Trigun to Chobits, fell into an uncertain state. And while some titles, like Ai Aoshi, would get picked up, a lot were in limbo for quite a while. I'm sure many people care about Ai Yoriyoshi. Uh If you hear my thoughts on that, I did a whole video on fan service. Watch it. Watch it there. Uh, hold on a minute. Calm down. I think I need an explanation. I apologize. When Jenny closed its doors, some titles got picked up for distribution by Funimation, but not all titles. Sure, some big ones like Ergo Proxy, Hel Helsing Ultimate, Black Lagoon, Kyokara Mao, Nanoha, Fate Stay Night, Rosen Maiden, Higurashi, they got saved. But many titles, even big ones like Chobits, it took longer for them to find a new home. And if you wanted to watch them, you had to either buy a secondhand DVD, go to your video rental store or library, or pirate. <laughs> Pirate sites became a haven for media preservation. And one such pirate site was a little known place called Crunchyroll. What about Crunchyroll? <laughs> Stop joking, Dan. Isn't that a sushi? Yes. It's ironic, isn't it? The very hub of modern anime distribution started life as a pirate site before it branched off into distribution and legitimate acquisition of anime. I mean, there's more money in legitimacy, I suppose. And Crunchyroll sure knows how to take every cent of your money from you. Now, when Crunchyroll became uh, successful enough and proved that it was a mo had a model capable of continual decade-long success, Sony acquired it. Again, a story of an anime di distributor who had a decade of success being acquired by a Japanese studio. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Deja vu. Genion's situation is far from unique, either. There were tons of companies over the years that acquired a bunch of titles before fizzling out of existence. Many pieces of anime history were lost. Warning, the following offer is for mature audiences only. Exciting, mysterious, intense, graphic, provocative, raw. This is no ordinary animation. This is the exotic, bizarre, and beautiful world of Japanese anime. I mentioned in a prior video the ADV dub for Evangelion. I'll tag it here, but the ADV dub for Evangelion was for a while unavailable. It wasn't lost media, of course. Tons of people had the DVDs and VHS tapes, but piracy proved one of the few ways you could watch Evangelion for some time. It's totally overrated. When Netflix redistributed the series, they redubbed it and didn't carry over the ADV dub. That, that's a load of bull! G Kids did release a special edition of Evangelion that contained that older dub, but it was a limited edition set. It's not easily available. At least it did get distributed again. But other dubs? That's not always the case. But we love the clown on the Sailor Moon Deke dub, and in fact, it proved one of the core motivations for releasing uncensored anime. You can't find a physical release of that dub anywhere, outside of secondhand tapes. And it came with a lot of original music and writing that is wholly unique to it. 
Do you think Serena should be the one to keep it? She's not really the world's most responsible person. She would probably use it for a nutcracker or worse. Mel, I think the responsibility is good for her. The only reason it's not lost media is due to a concerted effort by nostalgic fans. Let's be clear. Most anime isn't Sailor Moon, and even Sailor Moon isn't safe from media decay. It was recently discovered that the pink tint to most of Sailor Moon's animation was a result of degrading of the original animation cells, not the artistic intention of the artists. Now, what this means ultimately is that there are multiple versions of Sailor Moon just floating out there, all online, and it only thanks to fan efforts do these versions exist and you can access them right now. You can watch the old school version of Sailor Moon right now if you so wanted to. Because fans have taken the effort to preserve the media. Most anime are not as popular as Sailor Moon. Most anime do not have the lasting power of Sailor Moon. Many have forgotten a year after they come out. I guarantee that about five of the most hyped shows you're watching right now, next year, go forget the names. Sailor Moon had lasting power. What hope does an animator doesn't have in the face of, of, of this industry? Consider the story of Escaflone, an anime that has been dubbed multiple times. Was it all just a dream? Or was it a vision? While Escaflone is an incredible series, one of the best, prior releases have been sloppy, to say the least. I will change the future of mankind. Bandai released two iterations of Escaflone, uh, a re-edited version dubbed by the Ocean Group that was shown on Fox Kids, and an unedited version distributed by our friends at Genion. And uh, yeah, for a while, that was it. Now, years later, in 2016, Funimation would redub Escaflone entirely. And that version is available on the Funimation app as of this recording. But if you're watching this video, it might be too late. This puts the status of every iteration of Escaflone in the West on the line. And sure, Crunchyroll can redistribute it on Crunchyroll, but that is not guaranteed. Keep in mind, Crunchyroll has been saying they're going to get all of Funimation's titles on its service for a year now. What's the holdup? Why is it taking so long for these certain shows to not show up on the Crunchyroll app, despite the merger happening a year ago? Where are they? This means that Escaflone, once considered one of the greatest anime of the 90s, might be unavailable in the West, and that its multiple dubs will become out of print. And that genuinely sucks. That really sucks. But thankfully, this anime came out during the age of physical media. What about anime that came out more recently, in the era of smaller physical releases, less physical releases, or in some cases, no physical releases? What hope does an anime have when it comes out in that landscape? What happens when an anime is pulled off of a streaming service, and there's no physical release to fall back on? We don't have to ask that question because we already know the answer. Little Witch Academia is a beloved series, but its original two films, the source of inspiration, the test of concept that led to the series being made, it's unavailable. The show was originally distributed by Netflix, and Netflix stopped showing it. You can't watch them legally. You can pirate the movies, yes. And you're probably thinking, when did Netflix take off these movies? Well, this was back in 2019. For five years, the Little Witch Academy of movies have been gone. And Netflix has taken no efforts to redistribute this on physical media or re-upload it on Netflix. Or even license it out to a place like Tubi or Retro Crush. Nothing. It's just sitting on a shelf, unused. Without piracy, these short movies would be gone, period. And at this point, I think some of you are probably thinking, well, who cares? Some anime is just disposable entertainment. It doesn't matter. Who cares about Little Witch Academia? Or who cares about Escaflone? Well, I mean, I obviously care because I'm talking about it, but let's assume you don't care. That mentality is very bad for media and media preservation efforts. There are several shows and movies that would have been considered lost media if not for people 
passing on the tapes. This is a little bit of a sidetrack, but Doctor Who, obviously a lot of fans are very well aware of what happened to those old episodes. The BBC saw Doctor Who as disposable entertainment as well. And what they do is they would run out of film stock when recording live television or making TV shows, what have you. So what they did was they'd record over old episodes of their broadcasts. Now, for like a news broadcast, while that's bad from a historical standpoint, you know, you can make an argument that it's no longer relevant outside of archival purposes. But Doctor Who was a show, a serialized TV show, and they recorded over some major episodes, some landmarks in the history of Doctor Who. Now, obviously, no one at the time knew Doctor Who was going to become as long run of a success as it is now, but that's film history, television history, lost forever. And I can't guarantee anime won't suffer a similar fate. There are many anime that are considered very rare, commodities even. Um, especially if you go to the 80s OVA scene, especially if you go to the 90s OVA scene. Harmony Gold dub of Dragon Ball, for example, was considered lost media until someone found the tapes containing them. Well, if all this is just a hard drive on someone's computer and that's never uploaded, it's useless to anyone outside of that, that personal private collector. And it's not just, you know, recently we can talk about this. There's a lot of old films that were lost forever. 90% of all silent films are considered lost. And, and this is one film that almost was lost. Very famously, Nosferatu was an illegally made adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula. When Stoker's widow discovered the German expressionist film's existence, she filed to get every copy burned. Clearly she failed, but only thanks to the efforts of film collectors and film pirates. Even the film's own director believed the film to be lost media until it resurfaced in a private collection. And in some cases, the loss of media might hit a darker tone. Mom, it's the perfect midnight for me to leave home. And I heard on the radio that tonight there'll be a big full moon. Kiki's Delivery Service is easy to watch today. It's available in Europe on Netflix. In America, it's on Max. And G-Kids distributes it everywhere. And if you're in Japan, forget it. It's a whole theme park for Miyazaki. But when it was first dubbed by Disney on VHS, there were a lot of extra lines added in. And there were some changes made to the scripts. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that that version is better than the official version currently available. It's not. The, the, new, the current version is close to the text, it has more fidelity to the original story, it's more effective, and the ending is maintained. The original Disney release changed the ending by having Gigi the cat talk. I'm not going to get into Kiki's Delivery Service's plot right now, but if you've seen the movie, you know why Gigi talking changes the entire ending of that movie. So I'm, it's great. I'm glad this restored, better version exists. But in the process, the original Disney dub became unavailable. And this has two significant losses. For one, the they added American music. While I vastly prefer the original film soundtrack, a few pop songs were added at the opening and closing uh, of the movie. And I can't deny, they're nice. They're not bad. They're nostalgic. I, can't, I don't want to play the music because the YouTube gods would, like, strike me down. But, you know, they're not bad for a quick little listen. But it's so funny, too. Like, uh, Phil Hartman's voice in it is so funny. It's fun to work off of him, too. Whoa, whoa, don't panic! Kiki, that's a very small space! Whoa! Okay, nice landing. But the bigger loss is SNL alumnus Phil Hartman's ablived performance as Gigi, Kiki's pet cat. I'm here, and... Mm. Oh, these cookies! I gotta get the recipe from Les. Put that cookie down! No! Yes, a lot of Ghibli fans hate that Phil Hartman added extra dialogue to the film that changes the intent of the ending, and I don't disagree. The original ending is superior um, in all respects. It changes the messaging, it changes the tone. I'm not a fan of that. But Hartman added a lot of comedy to the film that was very charming and very well received by many growing up with the film. This character is relatively close to Phil. And those added lines are unavailable in all releases of Kiki's Delivery Service. And you probably think, oh, who cares? But a week after Kiki's Delivery Service premiered in the U.S., Phil Hartman was shot to death while sleeping in bed 
by his wife, Bryn Omdahl. His last role was as Gigi the cat in Kiki's delivery service. This means that the last thing Phil Hartman recorded, his final legacy, and something that really cemented him in the memory of tons of kids growing up in the 90s, is gone. It's truncated. It is unavailable for your purchase. You can't watch Phil Hartman in his entire final role. Not easily, anyway. You have to dig for it. And that sucks. That really sucks. I don't think I prefer the looser adaptation over the one true to the text. I've said this before, Kiki's Delivery Service is a masterpiece. The version that's true to the original script, that's the best version, hands down. But just because it's the best version does not mean we should erase the other versions. And there are other dubs for Kiki's Delivery Service too that are lesser known, that were made for airlines back in the day, but, you know, that's even harder to find. I'd like at least the option of seeing Phil Hartman's full, untruncated performance legally. Just the option. And maybe G-Kids has released it since I've lasted research on this. It's possible. You have no idea what will happen in the anime industry tomorrow to make things unavailable to you today. You need to have another source outside of the capitalist system who can preserve media. Because I guarantee you, companies don't have art interests in mind. They have their bottom dollar, and old entertainment that is not widely watched is not a commodity, it is not a product, it is space on a hard drive. It is, it, they are film canisters that can be recycled. They can be disposed. And they wouldn't care. Watch what's going on with with uh, Warner Brothers right now, with all their movies. They just toss them out. They just do not care. It is essential that we maintain these titles. Oh, and if you thought Japan was any better, forget it. They're just as bad as the Western companies. Because they will also just toss things out. A whole company in Japan a few months ago went out of business, and they were just tossing out old film reels. Some of which were the original masters of anime. <laughs> original film masters of these shows that were aired on television that were not given a physical release in, like, years. OVAs that were just put onto videotapes that were cheap and wore through, and by now the magnetic, magnetic tape is gone and useless, and they were just tossing out the film masters in the trash. Gone! So, America's not going to save you. Japan's not going to save you. The only thing that we can save is what we have in our hands. We are the last arbiters of this media preservation effort. And as a result, the, it ends with us. We have to preserve this media or else it is gone. If there is a show you value, if there is a movie you like, if there's a series that you think is important, save it. Put it on the hard drive. Put it on the Internet Archive. On the other day I was on the Internet Archive, I watched The Crow TV Show. Which is a bad show. It's not good. Watch a couple episodes of it. It was terrible. But it was HD restored. It was preserved. It survives. This remnant of a TV show. As long as the Internet Archive is around, and there are people trying to fight that too, these media, these pieces of media will survive. You can find old anime magazines there, scanlations of things from the 2000s that were like, again, printed on paper that was so cheap it rotted in your hands as you purchased them, that a good rainstorm would destroy, but they're preserved on a digital permanent platform right now. And you can save it all if you, indu if you decide to become a media pirate. There is a dwindling amount of independent studios distributing anime. This means most titles are being distributed by a shrinking number of companies with larger assets under their wings. And being a longtime anime fan has given me a perspective. The big dogs will one day be put down. Funimation was for years the biggest name in anime distribution, and it's now gone. And some of their titles are becoming unavailable. And, and that just fucking sucks, man. We can't guarantee companies and corporations will preserve art. In fact, we can guarantee they probably won't. It's all on us. If we want art to continue, 
We need to put our efforts behind media preservation efforts, even if it's piracy. After all, pirating a title that no one is selling isn't harming anyone. Uh, friends, thank you so much for getting through the video. Uh, I'm trying something new with this. I want to try having more of my face in these things. I feel like, you know, I, I, I'll be honest with you. It actually takes forever to record, to edit these videos. I can do 70 hours in a video, just finding clips that will get copyright struck if I, you know, if the wrong, if the bots act in against my favor. Uh, if you like what I do here, genuinely, please like, subscribe, follow. If you're following this, this long, please, you know, keep watching the video. Recommend it to your friends, whatever it takes. I'm a small channel trying to get bigger. We'll see how it goes. The Internet Archive is in danger from legislators out there trying to ban it or restrict what it can do. Call your senators, call your representatives. Try to save the Internet Archive because this is one of the last bastions of information that is decentralized and does not have a capitalist overlord trying to, you know, who can just delete it on a whim if, you know, the financial decisions fancy it. We need decentralized libraries and archives of information because I guarantee you the next destruction of the Library of Alexandria is happening in real time around us. If we do not fight to preserve media, it will all go. On that bleak note, um, anyway, have a good one.